Measuring Success Right, the official podcast of the Marriott Student Review, a podcast for students by students, where we connect the leaders of tomorrow with the issues of today. In our lives, whether we know it or not, we are likely living a question. It's a question that guides the way in which we do our work and even the way in which we operate outside of work. And the real issue becomes, what's your keystone question? Do you know it? And is it one that you really want to be living? Hal Gregerson is Executive Director of the MIT Leadership Center and Senior Lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Hal is also a photographer, innovator, and, most importantly, a catalytic questioner. Hal recently released a book entitled, Questions Are the Answer, a breakthrough approach to your most vexing problems at work and in life. This book is based on a project that examined how leaders can ask better questions to find better solutions. Questions that can, according to Hal, disrupt the world. Hi, Hal. Thanks so much for being here today. Congratulations on the new book. Thank you very much, Victoria. So, your book is all about asking questions. Can you tell us a little bit more about this question project and what experiences you had that led you to write the book? Big question. It is. Um, 30 years ago, I started studying leaders guiding organizations to go global. 20 years ago, as leaders guiding organizations to do transformation. 15 years ago, leaders guiding innovation. And the consistent thread across three decades of this research was these great leaders in all of those contexts excelled at asking questions to get better answers. And the, the reality is when we're in a world of globalization, transformation, digitization, all those sorts of things, we're operating on the edge of uncertainty. And when we're operating on the edge of uncertainty, there are no answers. And so the harder we initially search for an answer in those moments, the lower the probability we'll actually get them. In that sort of very unknown territory, questions really are the answer. And the trick becomes, how do you ask the better question? I like that. How do you ask the better question? So this might seem a little ironic because my role in this conversation is to ask you questions, <laughs> but why is asking the right questions, or as you phrased it, the better questions, so important to success? I'm very interested in a particular kind of question. I call it a catalytic question. What I mean by that is it's a question that that surfaces an assumption or a way of looking at the world that is fundamentally false. But it surfaces it in a way that we actually don't run from the question, but we embrace it, we get energy from it, and we do something good because of it. And so I'm not here to give anyone a list of questions to ask. But my approach in terms of the questions or the answer is we have to create the right conditions for the right question to surface, to unlock that window and door to something we never saw before. We have to create those sorts of conditions uniquely to the setting that we're in. Interesting. So when you mention these right conditions, it makes mm -hmm. me think about, I feel like I've seen a lot of videos of you speaking and read in your book a lot about your children and, and your grandchildren. So why do you talk about them so much? Can you tell us a little bit more about the childlike essence of questioning? <laughs> You may have seen in some of the presentations I've made about asking questions a picture of one of our granddaughters, um, three years old, Stella. And she was looking up at me with these eyes just riveted on figuring out what's grandpa thinking, what's grandpa doing. And as I looked at that picture after taking it, I realized she is watching me. And as adults, what we need to remember is that the children growing up around us in our homes and our community are watching whether questions matter or whether they don't. And to me, I want my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren all to grasp that in the world we're walking into, questions really matter. And here's why. We've got artificial intelligence. I work at MIT, and people are right on the edge of figuring out what that looks like, the superintelligence of the future. And you can take Stephen Hawking's viewpoint, which is it's quite um, problematic, meaning those superintelligence are, super intelligences are going to take over the world. Or you can take the perspective that maybe we have a chance. 
And I want my children and grandchildren to have a chance against the superintelligence. And here's the way in which that could happen. If we as human beings don't figure out ways to ask better questions than the computers do, they will win. And so the trick is, how do we harness all that artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, so that we and our children and our grandchildren can use that capability in ways that they can continue to ask the better question? And if we do that, I fundamentally believe there's hope for the future, for my children and your children and all of our posterity. But if we lose that capacity to ask the better question, I think we may well lose humanity. Right. Okay. So you've given me a very strong incentive here to, <laughs> to ask effective questions. Now, that makes me want to ask, what can I do, what can we do to develop these questioning habits, questioning practices? What's really interesting, Victoria, is that I've interviewed 200 plus of the world's most creative leaders. So people like Diane Green, who founded VMware, or Jeff Bezos at Amazon, or Elon Musk at Tesla, or you may have never heard of him, um, Nick Baden, who's the CEO of ASOS, right. the scene on screen anyway. All of those individuals deeply grasp that questions are the answer. And what's unique about them is if they were asked the question you just asked me, how do you ask a better question? They could explain it. And I often ask leaders in other contexts, well, how do you ask the better question? Right. And 90% of them have this look on their face like, I have no clue. And it's this embarrassing moment because in their head they know it's important, but in their behavioral practices, they are clueless about what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So a guy named Michael Sippy, who used to be the VP of product at Twitter, and now he's the VP of product at Medium, he told me, put yourself, Hal, in situations that cause you to ask the right question. Now, let me give you an example from home again. So he has young daughters. He intentionally, he and his wife intentionally buy multi-volume saga books to read with their young daughters, like The Little House on the Prairie. Oh, wow. And I'm like, why do you do that, Mike? And his response is, so that our children will walk through the lives of someone who faces very difficult things, and it will cause them to ask questions, that we then can talk with them about the real issues that matter. And so that's the spirit. He was creating a condition, a situation where his young daughters were asking questions because they were confronted with situations where they felt like this is wrong and I'm uncomfortable and they're reflectively quiet. And those are the conditions, whether we're children or adults, it's putting ourselves in situations that force us, cause us, us individually to feel, uh-oh, I'm wrong, that's in my head. And then, uh-oh, I'm uncomfortable, that's in my heart. And then the reflective quiet piece is we don't run from that disconfirming information, but we embrace it. Interesting. That's fascinating. So this reminds me a bit of your 424 project, creating sort of a daily environment in which we can question. Can you tell us a little more about what that is? So 20 years ago, actually teaching here at BYU, I was in a course, we were stuck talking about the issue of gender diversity and how do we create more inclusiveness for women in an organization. We were literally stuck and the energy was just completely low in the room. And so I thought to myself, what do we do? And in that moment, I thought, let's just ask nothing but questions about this issue. And so we filled the blackboards, filled them chock full of questions about this issue. The energy level rose in the room, the ideas about what we might actually do about it, there were plenty of them in the room. And in that moment, I realized something unique is going on here. And since then, I've done that process of asking nothing but questions. I call it a question burst with leaders and groups around the world, thousands of them. And so what I often do as a starter, beginner's entry into that approach, I call it a question burst, which is set a timer for four minutes and ask nothing but questions about the issue, challenge, and opportunity that you're stuck on. No answers to the questions, no explanations about why you're asking the questions, Nothing but questions. Do it yourself. Ideally, do it with other people. But you write those things down as fast as you can. And in four minutes, you're likely to get 15 to 20 questions. Here's what the data would tell me about at the end of those four minutes. 80% of the time, you and I will feel emotionally more positive about the situation, which is non-trivial because we're more likely to get creative new ideas and questions when we're feeling better about right. the world. 
80% of the time, you and I will have reframed our challenge. That means we were a little bit wrong. We've reframed and we think about it differently. 85% of the time, we'll have at least one new idea that might take us on a new path to do something about the issue. That's a four-minute investment in asking nothing but questions to unlock a new vista, a new window, a new opportunity. And so the 424 Project is about us as adults initially spending four minutes every day during the year asking better questions. The question burst might be one method of doing that. There are other ways of doing it. But imagine spending four minutes a day just trying to ask better questions. If we do that over the course of a year, it's 24 hours, thus the 424 Project. What if we as adults did that, took time intentionally to put ourselves in situations where we're wrong and comfortable and quiet and we ask a better question? And then what if we invite the children around us, our own or others, to do the same? That's my mild approach to nudge the questioning capacity of the world forward just a little bit. So this isn't just about business leaders and executives. This is something that applies to every single one of us. Oh, absolutely not. Thinking about how this applies to everyone, what do you feel are some of the most influential questions that you ask in your own life? In the course of interviews for the book, I interviewed Mark Benioff, who is simply amazing at asking questions constantly. He literally created the cloud that we have today, 20 plus years ago, by putting himself over and over in situations where he asks nothing but questions of all kinds of people that led him to the question of what if we sold enterprise-level software on the web like Amazon sells books that created the cloud, which then was a nuts idea. Right. But today, it's the dominant way of doing it. But, mm -hmm. but it took him all this work to get the right question to build that enterprise. Mark then introduced me to Tony Robbins. And it was an amazing conversation. And people have whatever view they might have, good or bad, about Tony Robbins. I was utterly intrigued by the degree to which he had carefully thought through the role of questions in his work. And he talks about a primary question, Tony does. I, talk, I use the same language, I call it a keystone question. In our lives, whether we know it or not, we are likely living a question. It's a question that guides the way in which we do our work and even in the way in which we operate outside of work. And the real issue becomes, what's your keystone question? Do you know it? And is it one that you really want to be living? So an experience that helped me surface my keystone question a few years ago was giving a speech in Southern California. And um, I got up early in the morning, 6.30 a.m., getting ready to go down to give the speech um, in La Jolla, California. And I had this pressure on my chest, and I thought, why am I anxious today? And so I you know, just sort of breathed deep and said a little prayer, and this is going to all work out. Went down, got my computer set up for the presentation, and the pressure just increased on my chest. I'm like, why am I so anxious? I've given this presentation hundreds of times. And then I like went out, got a little bit of fresh air, said a little prayer, came back in, gave a 90-minute speech, sat down, pressure came right back on my chest. My neck started to ache. I started to feel a little nauseous. I'm like, I need to get out of here. So I finally get out at a break, go up to the hotel room where my wife was, and I, she, as I walk through the door, she's like, you don't look well. What's going on? So I explained to her what I just explained to you, Victoria. And she's like, you having a heart attack? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm like, I honestly said, I don't know. But let's find out. So I pulled out my computer, <laughs> typed in heart attack symptoms, and boom, 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 like tick, 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 tick. And I looked up to my wife, Susie, and I said, yep, I'm having a heart attack. You always are, right, when you look it up. <laughs> so I, and she had just exercised. It was a bit sweaty. And, and, and she said, well, let me take a shower, and we'll go to the hospital. And then, no, let's go to the hospital right now. And so we took off to the hospital, and I had three, two of my major oh, arteries wow. almost fully blocked and had three stents put in. And uh, luckily, it was right next to a hospital instead of flying an airplane over the Pacific. <sighs> Two weeks later, I had been quite quiet, and, and, and I ended up talking with a counselor about the whole situation, like, what does this all mean for my life? And she had known me from before. She'd been a great coach and counselor in my life. And at one point in that conversation, she said to me, Hal, if you don't stop being nice to people, you're going to gift yourself a second heart attack. You've got to learn how to say no. Wow. And sometimes saying no is the 
kindest thing you could do to yourself and to others. It hurt. It was truthful. I knew I'd been wrong about approaching the world. I knew it explained a lot of the challenges I'd faced at work and in life. And, um, and I realized I want to change the question. And the question I'd been living was, how can I be nice to people? Now, that has its own history. These keystone questions have histories. And for me, it was growing up in a home with a father as large and as tall and twice as strong as I am, and um, he was emotionally abusive and at times physically. And as a little kid growing up, all you care about is, how can I you know, be safe here? So if I'm nice, maybe the world will be safe to me. And unbeknownst to me, I'd grown up living that question, not only as a kid, but also as a professional. So today, instead of asking myself, how can I be nice right here? It's how can I reflect or how can I magnify the light in this person next to me? And sometimes that means I make calls, I make judgments, I do things that make them really uncomfortable, but it's probably the best thing to be done. And that's a very different way of living because of a very different question that's worth living. That's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that story. Mm -hmm. What I really appreciate about all of this, I suppose, is that you're not just talking about what you do in the office. You're talking about how the questions and the way you approach business problems applies to your personal life and to your concerns, to your family, to your future, to the way you treat other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very profound lesson that a lot of us can take away from this book and, and from this life, I suppose. Can I share something about that? Yes, please um, do. So, Rose Mercario, um, who is, is now the CEO of Patagonia, mm -hmm. years ago, she's working in finance, she's being driven through Manhattan to a big deal to be done, a big deal to be signed, a big finance deal. And a woman crosses, starts crossing the sidewalk that forces her car to stop on the rush to this big deal. And the woman's walking in a wobbly fashion and slowly, and Rose is really impatient with it all. And there came a moment where she realized that the woman walking across the street was like her mother. And her mother had deep psychological problems when she was growing up, and she figured this woman's got the same. She's still in a hurry to get to the, get to the place, but she looks out the window impatiently waiting, and she sees her own reflection in the window. And Rose thinks to herself, what have you become? Wow. She then gets out, goes into Central Park, thinks about it, and realizes something needs to change here. And five years later, she quit her job, became the CFO of Patagonia, and then now she's a CEO. Patagonia is a place where they do amazing things. They create terrific products that are for the best of the best in the world in terms of outdoor experiences that they, they're doing that for. But that company, Patagonia, got started by Jon Schoenard, who was a mountain climber, a rock climber, and his question that started the company was, how can I be in a business and keep my soul? And he was trying to live that tension. And there have been subsequent questions all the way since, for decades, that have guided that organization. So it's not just keystone questions that guide people, like I just described, but it's keystone questions that guide organizations to great success. And so Patagonia just changed their mission statement. It's very simple. We exist to save our home planet. That's it. Mm -hmm. Now imagine getting up and going to the work to that sort of an organization where, you know, Matt Dwyer, who runs the materials, the materials for all of Patagonia, what kinds of stuff are we going to put into our, 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 our products? He's got to not only get a cutting-edge coat, but he's got to save the planet at the same time. And what's beautiful is, in that world where they're operating, they are on the edge of uncertainty, and they are using this questioning capacity at the very core to do great work. I wore a Patagonia sweatshirt yesterday, and now I'm very, <laughs> I'm very excited to wear it again. So I don't want to give too much away, so I'm only going to mention the very beginning of the book. You start your prologue with a quote from Elie Wiesel, which reads, In the word question... There is a beautiful word, quest. I love that word. Why did you start with this quote? How does a quest play into this process for you? The questions that really matter at working in life really are a quest. It's a journey to get there. And we don't find these questions 
by sitting in our office usually, and we don't find them in that sort of passive way. There's a colleague of mine, Clayton Christensen, who once told me how important it was to actively seek passive data. And what he's basically saying is, in our world of digital and social media and everything, and for leaders and organizations, they're constantly getting active data shoved at them. And, and Clay's view is we need to actively seek passive data. And that's what I'm saying by actively seeking out situations where we're wrong and uncomfortable and quiet. That's when we uncover the questions that change our work, our world, and our lives. So Lindsay Levin founded an organization called Leaders Quest. Now I'm coming back to your quest question. <laughs> and Leaders Quest is all about creating these excursions, journeys for mostly senior level leaders to go into places around the world where their assumptions are going to be challenged deeply. And so in one of these scenarios, imagine a group of very senior professionals, business, government, and otherwise, deeply committed to the environmental cause. Imagine that group of people in your head. She's taking that group into the heart of West Virginia, coal mining country in the United States. And as they drive through that, those, those roads to this small coal mining community, they realize really fast how fallen apart this place is. They see the decrepit buildings. They see the boarded up buildings. They realize something's wrong here. Now, Lindsay knew from her prior work going into that space that this is one of the opioid academic crisis places of the, of the country, if not the world. It's just a difficult environment, and they're simply trying to make a living to survive. So Lindsay's taking these environmentalists into that space, into that coal mine. And they literally went down into the coal mine, did an excursion, talked with the people there, talked with the miners. Um, and they're, after this visit in the mine, they come up and they're talking with the manager of the mine. And kind of imagine the sort of self-righteous smugness that would be an environmentalist being in that space. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's overstating it, but you can kind of get the feel. Right. And um, he's explaining how important it is for this mine to survive and why it's so economically crucial to them. And, and then Lindsay interrupts him and says, tell us about your family. And he's like, a little bit awkward in the moment, but he starts to say, well, we have five children. And then Lindsay, like, then Lindsay said, tell us more. Then he got a little more quiet and he said, these five children... We adopted them from opioid-addicted parents who couldn't take care of them. The room went dead silent because everyone in that room knew that they couldn't do what they just heard this man describe he and his wife did. It changed the way they looked at the world. They left committed to do something if they possibly could, to help that community be better. That's why quests matter in the places where we're forced to face the uncomfortable. And that's how we change. And that's how we get the motivation for others to change, to build a better place. Wow, thank you. So it seems to me that this book means a lot more to you than just putting a theory out there for other people to understand. And, I mean, you interviewed over 200 different people. You asked a lot of questions. This mm -hmm. was, in many ways, I suppose, a type of quest for you, just making these discoveries and writing this book. It's a great way of putting it. How has that changed your perspective? What, what are your new questions now after going through this process? Every one of us have deep demands on our lives, you know, be it work and beyond. You know, I think for most of us, it's almost um, exhausting at times in terms of the, the, the pressures to get things done. And I'm no different. You know, the, you wake up in the morning and sometimes you feel anxious and you're trying to get things done. And we've had some things happen you know, unexpectedly in our family. We're a blended family. Um, 
it's a, it's a wonderful blend of uh, she had four, I had three, so I got acquired a bit. And we have seven kids and eight grandkids, and one more on the way next month. Congratulations. Um, thank you. And and one of our children had some really difficult things happen a few weeks ago that is unsettled and, and caused us as a family to, to approach some things differently to help and support uh, that, 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 child, that adult child of ours. And what I've come to realize in the middle of all this unexpected um, pressure is that do I believe questions are the answer or don't I? Was it just a cute book, an acute title, or, or is it something more substantive? And I find myself, like so many other people, having to wake up and, and, and really confront that question, are questions really the answer? And I've come to the conclusion that in a, in a time in my life when it feels it's a moment stuck, like what do we do now, those are the places, those are the moments when even I sometimes forget to step back whether it's doing a question burst and in a quiet moment to myself being a little wrong and uncomfortable by spending four minutes and generating nothing but questions, or whether it's taking a moment to talk to somebody I normally wouldn't talk to, or whether it's taking a moment to maybe go visit with some people in a similar situation who have had some change, you know, some of the same challenges. You know, those things, to do those kinds of ta- activities that get us out into the world, that that put us in those conditions of being wrong, comfortable, and quiet, it's never convenient, and it's rarely easy. But all I, I'm learning um, through writing the book, and now through trying to live it myself even better, that um, it's well worth the journey, because it, it, it opens up, the questions open up an avenue we otherwise would never consider. Make sure you subscribe to our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or SoundCloud so you never miss an episode. Be a friend and tell a friend about Measuring Success Right. This podcast is a project of the Marriott Student Review at Brigham Young University. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Marriott Student Review or online at MarriottStudentReview.org. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect official policy or position of Brigham Young University or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.